approach, uh, data collection approach, findings, and then the training AMP coaches using um, a web-based tool. Okay, so for introductions, my name is Celeste Seibel. I'm the project manager of the Achievement Plan Project. Uh, I'm, Sh oh, well, here you go. <laughs> I'm Sharice Jackson. I started as an AMP coach on the project, and I am now an AMP trainer. Uh, I'm Janet Walker. I'm the uh, director of the Research and Training Center, Pathways Research and Training Center, as well as a co-director of the National Wraparound Initiative. And the PI of uh, oh. my friend. <laughs> okay. So what is that? AMP. AMP stands for Achievement Plan, and it was an intervention designed for young people with serious mental health challenges, um, and has been de developed to support young people to learn skills, set goals, um, become more active and engaged in their treatment planning. And um, AMP was originally designed to be a wraparound enhancement. Okay. So, Deanna, would you like to talk a little bit about oh, okay. why we enhanced wraparound? Okay, so the reason that we got started on this whole uh, AMP project was because our early research, um, including my probably one of my very first wraparound projects, I went around and observed wraparound teams in 11 states and 72 different wraparound teams. And um, when people nominated the top uh, concern that they had about wraparound, um, for both providers and young people, it was young people's engagement in wraparound. And that's continued to be true, I think, uh, indicated by a lot of the data that we gather through different modalities, through the WAFA system, through our community support system, and certainly anecdotally. Um, there's also some research which is reviewed on a publication that we have on our website. If you look at the, uh, if you look at Pathways RTC, if you put that into a web search, you can see the Achieve My Plan projects. We have a bunch of publications associated with that project. And originally we reviewed um, the research on treatment planning, which documented uh, pretty convincingly that young people were not meaningfully engaged in treatment, team treatment planning, in either the IDP process and systems of care and wraparound specifically. Um, and again, as I mentioned, the professionals were also not satisfied and felt that they did not have good strategies for, uh, for uh, how to engage young people. And uh, certainly I would say that our ongoing experiences reinforce that, that still when we come to sites are very eager for support around this particular topic. So um, this is what we call original AMP, and you'll see the need for that uh, later because we, had, we now have um, two new AMPs. Um, and the idea was really to develop an enhancement that would require minimal, if any, resources um, but that could dramatically increase youth participation. So we wanted a, a good bang for the buck ratio. Um, and to help us ensure that we were, we were doing something that would be feasible and attractive, we worked extensively with an advisory board when we developed AMP. So we co-developed AMP with young people, family members, and service providers. Um, and we had, originally we did a pilot study, we had a pre-post study that showed uh, really substantial uh, improvements from before AMP to after in terms of young people's participation uh, and also their engagement, like how much they felt that, that the planning process was being responsive to them and how satisfied they were. So on the basis of that data and that experience, we undertook the uh, randomized study that we're gonna talk about today. Um, and this took place in three counties in the Portland, Oregon metro area and compared young people who were receiving wraparound as usual versus young people who were receiving AMP, I mean wraparound with the AMP enhancement. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so guiding without leading. So in conversation with another person about their thoughts and ideas, a delicate balancing act, as you can see by the picture. Um, <laughs> this is where the young person's not totally leading the session, the coach isn't leading the session, but they're kind of um, having that balance. So why is guiding without leading so important? Well, it really encapsulates the AMP's theory of change. Um, guiding the coach's role is to provide, to provide strong facilitation of a process for helping young people define their own goals and take action with the team's support. So just really all the ideas, um, the goals, the thoughts, all coming from the young person. It really focuses on teaching the steps of the process. So really increasing those self-determination skills of the young person um, and really helping the young person construct experiences where they will deploy new skills and learn. 
again, why is it so important? Um, without leading really uh, ensures a youth-driven approach. Again, um, the young person is having the confidence in their own interests, ideas, and capacities. Um, the coach is active in guiding the young people to see themselves as having those strengths and capacities, so it's not just the coach telling them that they're having them, but it's actually um, encouraging the young person to really believe it. Uh, so this was the intervention. So we would uh, have a total of three prep sessions before their team meeting. So prep one would really focus on um, identifying the young person's strengths and goals and drafting a plan of like an activity that they're um, interested in doing. Uh, prep two would be setting the agenda for their RAP meeting, which may have been a little different than how their current RAP meetings uh, were going. So they would really decide what areas of the agenda that they'd want to lead, what they'd want others to lead. Um, they would identify some support and think of like who really they want at the meeting. Prep three would be really practicing for the meeting. So reviewing the agenda, would they have tools like flashcards, um, really going over that plan for support and the support they need during the meeting and then there'd be the team meeting. And then after the intervention was over, then we'd hand it off to the care coordinators to kind of pick up uh, where the coach would leave off. Can I, can I just make one clarification? So the preparation for AMP is, uh, is there's sort of two main pieces to it. One is for the young person to select an activity that's connected to a goal that they find personally meaningful. So they're placing that from their own perspective. It's something that gets added to the agenda. And we have a process for ensuring it's something that the, that the team is going to support, but it comes from their perspective. And then we also prepare them, coach them on how to contribute to the other agenda items. So all the agenda items that the rest of the team needs bring. So it's not, it's a, the activity that they do, it's usually a fairly small portion of the meeting, but it's something that is, it is completely comes out of their ideas. So that's an addition. And the rest is just preparing them to interact positively and productively with the team and to have ideas about what the other aspect, the other agenda items are, if that's placement or treatment or whatever it is, so that they can really uh, actively speak up uh, for their perspective during the team meeting. So ways that the AMP coach would support um, the young person at the team meeting, they would really act as a process advocate, they'd model and enforce team meeting ground rules to the rest of the team, um, they really keep the, move, the meeting on track and moving forward, really creating an inclusive environment where the youth's participation is really included in the meeting, um, really keeping the meeting focused on the agenda, and just ensuring that everyone is really clear about the next steps and responsibilities. Some other ways that the AMP coach supports youth at meetings, um, just really assisting the young person if they got lost or overwhelmed, um, really asking the team members sometimes to slow down and um, maybe explain acronyms if they're using big words or if things are uh, unclear or confusing. Providing the young person with opportunities to share a comment. So again, just really including the young person's voice and participation in the meeting and really modeling that effective communication and just ways that the team can include the young person's voice in the meeting. Okay. All right. Um, so, um, like Janet mentioned earlier, we worked with um, three wraparound providers that were in the Portland metro area, and that was uh, Multnomah County, Clackamas County, and Washington County. And the criteria for young people to participate in the study is um, they needed to be receiving wraparound services, and they also needed to be um, between the ages of 11 and a half and 15 and a half um, if they were in care. And if they were not in care, then it was 11 and a half and uh, 18. And that's because we had an ongoing um, study that was also looking at the same age um, group. And we just didn't want our interventions to cross over with each other. So that's why we had that um, change in age there. And then uh, the only other criteria was that the young person was likely to receive wraparound services for the next um, six months. So they have a chance to um, experience the intervention all the way through. Okay, so design and measures. Um, like we've mentioned, it was a random, excuse me, randomized study, and um, the care coordinators were randomly assigned as control or intervention groups. And then as the incoming new clients were randomly assigned to either the control or intervention care coordinators. So we made the choice to randomize the care coordinators opposed to the young people, because we felt like it would be confusing for the care coordinators to be 
practicing AMP with some young people and then not practicing AMP with the control group. So that's why we made that decision. In terms of our assessments, we were looking at um, telephone and online surveys, and that went to young people, caregivers, and care coordinators. Uh, we also did post-meeting evaluation, so at the end of the meetings, how did it go? What did they think? And then also, um, we recorded one team meeting, team meeting video and looked at um, certain things like um, the amount the young person was contributing, um, types of questions that were asked to the young person, those types of factors. And these were our measures that we used. So we were looking specifically for youth participation, alliance with the team, mental health, recovery, and meeting satisfaction. And um, as you'll notice, um, the Y stands for young person, um, CG caregiver, caregiver, and CC care coordinator. So we pretty much asked, used the same measures for everybody except for the um, mental health uh, recovery scale that we used. So here is our timeline. And um, basically, the uh, young person and the caregiver would be consented into the study. And then we would um, complete the first um, assessment, so baseline, before um, any intervention work was done. And then um, we would then again assess right after the target team meeting. And um, those of you familiar with wraparound, usually wraparound meetings happen about every 30 days. So then we would, again, um, there would be a second um, team meeting. And this would be the point that the care coordinator would take over um, the work that was being done. So our AMP coaches would then transfer um, their work onto the care coordinator with the young person. And then we would, again, let's see if there's any other uh, animation. I kind of like animation, so I think it's kind of jazzy. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, we would follow along for that third um, team meeting. So then after the third team meeting, we would um, assess one more time. So it was a very um, brief intervention, um, and we looked at it again across about uh, three team meetings. Missed that? <laughs> OK, so um, here are our totals. We had a total of 55 uh, young people that participated in the study. 20 were control, 35 were intervention. Um, a total of 47 caregivers, 19 were control, 28 were intervention. And then a total of um, 20 care coordinators, so 10 were control and 10 were intervention. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to Janet who's gonna talk about our findings. Sure. So one thing that I think we didn't mention was who the AMP coaches were. So the coaches were actually students, university students, um, both undergrad and master's level students. Um, and Charisse was a coach as, as an undergrad. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and um, Celeste was sort of our, our coach's coach. Mm -hmm. So she was uh, in charge of making sure that everybody learned what they needed to do. So this is looking at the data that we got from videotaping the first meeting uh, for those who had been in the intervention, that would be the intervention after the AMP inter after they had received those three sessions of AMP coaching to prepare them for the team meeting. And for the control young people, it would just be basically a meeting as usual, except of course there's a video camera there and you just took a bunch of assessments and you'll see there's definitely an impact from that uh, in the other um, data. So uh, what we found, so we tried to measure various aspects of participation and um, Basically, what you'll see control and intervention is the percentage of segments, so we looked at one minute segments, where um, this thing was going on. And one thing that we found in our pre-post study was the teams after they were doing AMP, they were actually much more organized um, because everybody had to get their agenda items. So one of the things we asked the organization to do, they have to give their agenda items to the young person beforehand so that the coach and the young person can work on preparing. And between that and the little uh, outline that we had for our agenda, it seemed that people were actually staying on task more. Um, we didn't get a significant finding. You can see there's a T over there. That means a trend level finding, not quite um, significant. Um, and then the final column is adjusted for multiple comparisons. So we were, you know, we're pretty conservative in that final column about what we actually call a finding. Um, 
So we had the youth leading completely a whole, these are minute segments, so they led more significantly leading uh, than also speaking a significant amount of the segment was also more in the intervention. So every comparison favored the intervention, but only some of them were significant. Um, we had some criteria for team having essentially a kind of positive or strengths-based interaction with the youth, also in favor, but not significantly <coughs> so, of the intervention. Um, oh, the youth, again, we stress this sort of pragmatic communication between the young person and the team. You know, how can you express something so your team is going to be most likely to hear it, to want to support what you have to say? So that's a big part of our coaching. Um, again, that was um, significant to trend uh, after adjustment for the multiple comparisons. Um, this one's uh, team invite high level contribution. This is when the team is engaging the young person and asking for their opinions, their ideas, et cetera. Um, clearly it, it was happening more uh, in the intervention. Um, supportive response to, to ideas, uh, again, about equal. Team agreeing to act on the use idea. Uh, only seem to happen in the intervention case. Uh, and then we did find we have this idea of process advocacy, which we think of as another way of, of uh, it's used in the team literature a lot to show good team process going on. So people making different comments about how the meeting is going and what has to happen next or the agenda, et cetera. Again, in favor pretty distinctly for the intervention group. Um, so that was the uh, video data. Then we also, as um, Celeste mentioned, we collected post-meeting surveys for all three times. Um, and that uh, was broken out into two different scales. One that was looking at this, just the different aspects of youth par participation. And you can see some of the samples there. They had multiple opportunities to present their ideas. They uh, pr participated meaningfully in discussion. They, they um, Taught, they had ideas on agenda items that weren't just their own, et cetera. So there were nine items for that, and that's the alpha for the internal reliability of the scale. And then there was a getting things done scale that kind of got at that other aspect. You know, did they stick to the agenda, get important planning, et cetera, done. So we wanted to see from their perspective were these things happening, not just from the sort of objective measures that we were using from the analysis of the video. And so... Those are just, these are just numbers. We had everybody that was in the meeting do a survey. I have not yet attempted to do any more sophisticated analyses uh, by role, but those are the roles. We did look across time, and I'll be showing that in a second. Um, actually, that's not true. We did a little bit by role, uh, but not everything that you could look at. So um, you can see here what you're seeing here. So uh, we put all of the items on a scale uh, of four being the best and um, one being the worst. And you can see that the intervention had higher scores across the three meetings than the control group for that uh, scale composed of youth participation items. And there was a, a significant effect in favor of the intervention. Um, and you can see also there was also, a, uh, well, you can see there, it was also a significant meeting effect where the um, overall uh, positive nature of the meeting of uh, youth participation was deteriorating over time. And the fact that that happened in the control meeting as well, uh, across the control meetings as well as the intervention meetings, um, I think is probably just part of that. We were in the meetings, people knew they were part of the research project, everybody was being interviewed, everybody was giving feedback, etc. So there was, there was a deterioration. I think also, um, as the other data will show, um, we'll talk about this later, I actually think for the intervention youth, the handoff to the care coordinators proved somewhat problematic. Um, getting them to actually do even a, so our, our protocol calls for this sort of big, uh, the three sessions of AMP before the first meeting and then booster, what we call booster sessions in between, which are not supposed to be as involved. Um, but it was really difficult to uh, pass over control, uh, pass over the AMP intervention, I think effectively to the care coordinators because they hadn't been so thoroughly trained in the AMP model as our coaches had. And I'll talk a little bit more about what our response to that challenge has been. Um, so similarly, getting things done, um, there was still an advantage for the intervention, uh, not the, the meeting, uh, the main effect for intervention, the meeting effect was not present in this uh, analysis. Um, and then overall satisfaction, this is based on actually one question where people were asking was the meeting, rating whether the meeting was um, 
you know, it's not as worse than usual, uh, really worse than usual, a little worse than usual, somewhat better than usual, a lot better than usual. And most people pretty much like their wraparound meetings, but again, in favor of the intervention. Um, and why we like this, and we all, I also broke this out for uh, care coordinators and caregivers separately, is because I think there's a fear sometimes that if you give over maybe too much of the meeting to the young person's concerns, that other people will feel that their concerns are being crowded out. We did not find that at all in our data. So we feel like everybody, it was a win-win, not a win-lose. So that was something that we were very concerned about. And I think that um, if it's not handled right, it can, it can become maybe more confrontational. But our process is very much, again, about that pragmatic. How can you enlist the help of your team? Um, so this is the final set of data that we had from the assessments of phone or they were either in person, over the phone, or uh, online, depending on who the respondent was and what their preferences were. Um, so this is a summary of a bunch of different stuff. Uh, these are basically um, a regressions that are um, looking at the difference in the scale in the assessment between time one and time two based on whether they were in the intervention or not, what their role was, and whether there was an interaction between those two. Um, and you can see generally that there were stronger effects for the most part at T1, from T1 to T2. Again, we had that issue of the handoff after the first team meeting. Um, maybe also the novelty effect wearing off. Um, but we had very strong effects for the, this is the youth participation in planning scale. So from, <clears throat> from people's, pers wow, five minutes. Okay, um, so we had we had very strong impacts uh, for on the on the planning. This SFSS, this is uh, so uh, symptoms and functioning severity. severity scale that we used for externalizing and internalizing. We didn't necessarily think we were going to see a huge change there, but again, everything was in favor and trending in favor of the intervention group. We think if we had a a, a more ambitious intervention. Oh, thank you. Oh, but I, we're only half an hour. Okay. So now you're really confusing me. Okay. We're back to really rushing through. Um, so we we were gratified that things were going in the right direction, but really not surprised. I mean, they're getting wraparound. They're getting a million services. AMP is a small component, and it's really designed to be an intervention that enhances engagement. We do think over time that we might have a bigger impact, but we're only looking at six to eight weeks out here, so not a lot of time for things to develop. Um, so here's an example of, of the young pe of all respondents on the participation in planning, uh, the preparation subscale for that. This looks pretty typical, control mostly flat, intervention peaking at T2 but still staying above at T3. So I mean I would say that sort of picture characterizes a fair amount of our findings. Um, it would have to, I'd have to do a bunch of slides to show it all. So we had some youth only measure. Um, the WAI is the uh, team alignment, what's it called? Alliance. alliance, whatever. It's alliance scale. It's the one that we, everybody uses. We changed it to be team, team alliance. There, we did collect this data for the caregivers and the care coordinators, but the wording on the team stuff was very strange. So this just is showing the, the um, young people felt that their uh, provider alliance was improving. Uh, at, at time at time three and our empowerment scales again they were trending in the right direction but not significant uh, and also this is this is only the use so again we have only a third of the sample at this point so our model has to be uh, is less sensitive okay so very briefly I think we have um, from that pretty decent evidence that AMP ha can have a significant impact on youth engagement and participation and that's a measure on kind of a variety of different modalities and different perspectives an impact from youth is particularly pronounced. They actually skipped over a little bit of that analysis, but um, they, uh, there were some of those interactions for young people that were significant in uh, indicating an additional impact from AMP. Not a zero-sum approach, as I mentioned, the difficulty in handoff to the care coordinators, and then perhaps if there were a higher dose or a longer duration, that it might actually impact those empowerment uh, and the empowerment measure and the mental health status to a significant level. Um, and we're going to talk then now about what we wanted to build on as a basis. 
we have since kind of divided up original AMP and focused on just training the care coordinators to do the AMP process. So we have a project now that we're evaluating with the state of Massachusetts where they're implementing AMP statewide. And I think they're pretty happy with it. They certainly said so this morning. Yeah. Um, and we are taking some assessment, but it's mostly assessment of perceived competencies on, on the part of the providers there that we're measuring because it's, it's, we don't have the resources for this, that study to look at outcomes. And then we have also been training, uh, we developed and are now pilot testing the AMP, what we're calling AMP Plus as a peer support. So the, our, the coaches will actually be peer support and they will stay engaged with the young person. So none of that handoff stuff. The handoff stuff was just not gonna work. And uh, I'm gonna quick turn it over to you guys again to talk a little bit about our training approach because it was something that we learned a lot about okay. while we were doing this. So very, very quickly, um, the training model that we use and that has been really effective in our trainings with Massachusetts, who I know is in here, hey, <laughs> and we're also working with Kentucky with our AMP Plus model. But really, um, the key thing is, is that um, the, the trainees will review a piece of the AMP curriculum, so um, we will present a piece of the curriculum, and then they will get a watch, an expert um, coach, go through how to do that prep session or that work, and um, then they'll get a chance to practice. So they'll go out, they'll get a practice with maybe, um, if it's their first time trying it out with what we like to call a practice person, so maybe not a client, but someone that they can practice the intervention with. And then they get to have some feedback. So Sharice and myself, we'll review the video, we'll watch it, we'll look for um, things that are going really well, and also areas where maybe the coach can improve. Sometimes that includes um, curriculum clarification, um, and just, elements that we can talk through about how to strengthen the coach's approach. Um, and we've found that no one loves to videotape themselves and uh, you know submit it online to us, <laughs> but um, it is a very effective tool in um, seeing practice in action and then also getting that loop of feedback. And then basically, we then repeat the process again, so then we move on to the next chunk of the curriculum and then there's a chance to observe um, practice and receive feedback. And in case you're wondering how we do that, uh, we use this tool, it's called the Virtual Coaching Platform, and it's a web-based tool where we get to watch the video, we have our themes and techniques that we're looking for, and it's broken into one-minute segments, and then we have a chance to then put in comments, and um, those are the comments that lead our feedback conversations with the people who are being trained. And we're looking specifically for our themes, and I just had to put these on here because we love them, and they guide our work, but uh, youth-driven, um, helping the young person to identify their strengths and assets, um, positive connections to people and community, expanding skills and promoting discovery, and then guiding, keeping it on track. And that's specifically what the coach um, is doing in the session. They're making sure that not only are they um, engaging with the young person in a positive way, but are they working towards something? Are they moving in a direction? So, some helpful things about the VCP. The coach can watch example videos um, through the VCP, so that's where we can put those example videos up of a, um, a lead coach doing the intervention. Um, they can also watch their uploaded videos, which who has um, either listened to those process recordings or um, themselves in uh, action? Okay, we know that it can be a little uncomfortable, but it's such a powerful learning tool. Um, and then the last little piece is that we can create clips and the coaches can go on and also observe those clips. And I, we're out of time, so I'm gonna stop. So, I think, ah, last slide. <laughs> So just one clarifying thing in case it was confusing. So we're in Oregon and they're in Massachusetts and we don't go there at all. <laughs> all of this is based on online learning designed kind of more along the lines of what a, like a college course would be versus what a typical, you know, kind of one week learn it all sort of training. So this is a, a model that we um, think really corresponds to kind of best practices in, in coaching and training so that there's a, a kind of a slow accumulation of, of knowledge and practice through these cycles.